Kia ora. It is my pleasure to welcome Mr. David Shanks to Kia. Uh, Mr. Shanks is the Chief Censor, Office of Film and Literature Classification. David is a senior public servant who has played key roles in developing policy and implementation solutions within the broader context of education, health, uh, social development and well-being. Before stepping into this role as Chief Censor, David was Director, Health, Safety and Security at the New Zealand Ministry of Education. He also served as a Deputy Chief Executive and Chief Legal Advisor for the Ministry of Social Development. Most recently, uh, David, you might have seen him in the news for his role in banning uh, the Christchurch uh, Terrorist Manifesto, which has also then been uh, an anchor for a global conversation on um, control and monitoring of um, uh, digital articulations. The Christchurch Manifesto, uh, that is uh, a global anchor to conversations on uh, how do we regulate uh, digital platforms and digital conversations, is a reflection of that. Questions of censorship uh, today in broad areas of violence, sex, uh, pornography are particularly uh, uh, rendered salient because of the digital climate we are amidst and particularly with reference to the critical implications for population health and well-being, as well as questions of media literacy. How then do these questions uh, connect with uh, the other question of uh, free speech, how you balance free speech with media regulation in a globally transforming digital environment? It is therefore uh, really pertinent to be having this conversation with you, uh, David, not only for your role in New Zealand, but also in many ways, uh, the kind of um, uh, discursive leadership you're providing to uh, the broader uh, regulatory conversations elsewhere uh, globally. So welcome. Thank you, Professor. Great. Um, maybe we can begin by uh, talking a little bit about what a chief censor does. Mm. Look, absolutely. Um, what a chief censor does all day is worthy of its own reality TV show, I think. In fact, I've, I've only been in the role just over two years, and I think I've been in the role for um, a matter of a few weeks when um, we were trying to deal with a particular problem. Someone came in with another issue about uh, classifying an adult dating website, and someone else was talking about another classification issue and I literally said we need a reality TV show crew here because you literally won't believe kind of the conversations we have and what we deal with unless you know <laughs> um, I don't think that'll ever, ever happen but I mean our day-to-day -day work um, breaks down into broadly two categories we have a commercial flow of work where we're classifying generally age classifying and providing warnings and consumer information around consumer products so that's typically cinema release films, um, releases on DVD, and game releases that, that come out on physical media. That, that's a stream of commercial work that's long been um, a, a core staple for the office. On top of that is what we call crown work, which is essentially uh, work um, with material sent to us from law enforcement agencies such as police or internal affairs, customs, um, where they have found um, uh, video clip, audio, it could be um, written material that um, is at risk of being objectionable, illegal under New Zealand law. And so that material is referred through to us for assessment and classification as well. Beyond that, from time to time, as a Chief Censor, I have a call-in power, which means that I can actually reach out and call in a publication for classification um, and a publication is very broad. It can mean anything that has text or audio or um, image, imagery in it. I, I can't use that power too frequently. I've got a small office of um, less than 20 staff currently, um, but from time to time we have complaints raised with us uh, by the public or health professionals or people on the front line, um, and we will respond and, and call in material. Mm. So, you know, let me give you an example. Say I am running a Facebook page uh, that talks about vaccines uh, causing autism. Uh, do you have the power to call that in? I would have the power to call that in. Um, under our law, 
any digital file is essentially a publication in the terms of our Act. Um, a Facebook page is challenging because it's constantly changing, yeah. right? So um, part of the conceptualization of our Act being really designed in the late 80s and uh, promulgated in 1993, um, you know, the view there was a publication was a fixed thing. It was a book or it was a um, film or, or um, DVD or whatever. Um, a Facebook page is, is constantly moving, so that's one challenge. But we can take a snapshot of a Facebook page mm. and treat that as a publication. In terms of the issues raised about vaccination, um, that's an interesting one, right? Because we have a set of classification gateways that we need to apply uh, prescribed in our legislation. And the gateways are essentially um, sex, violence, horror, promotion of crime type categories. Mm -hmm. um, disinformation and information that might be harmful in terms of um, uh, the, the, the um, herd immunity or, or public health considerations is not something that would trigger the gateways under our Classification Act as it's currently configured. Um, nor does, for example, um, gambling type functionality. Mm. So that's something we're also currently thinking about and uh, talking to agencies about in terms of the fact that games increasingly have what are called loot boxes, which um, in some configurations can be the kind of digital equivalent of a, of a slot machine, right? Mm -hmm. It triggers the same sort of serotonin pathways. Now we can't classify for that. It doesn't trigger the, the traditional classification gateways, but I think it's worth thinking about whether it should and whether consumers should be um, at least warned about that sort of functionality. Mm -hmm. So let's come back to these uh, gateways. You talked about four uh, different areas. Maybe you can uh, uh, speak a little bit uh, to each one of those. Well, I think in terms of the gateways, you know, it's easiest to think about this when we're assessing, say, a, a cinematic release film. Which is, which is, again, a core staple of our day-to-day -day commercial work. Um, some films will have um, a large amount of violence in them. Um, and increasingly we're seeing films um, coming out of Hollywood in particular that will um, be restricted really only for violence. They won't have um, sexual content, they won't even necessarily have sexual violence, they might not have horror, um, but uh, a huge amount of gun violence. Um, it only needs to trigger one gateway for us to go, actually that could be a problem in terms of impact on young people in particular, um, issues around imitation, desensitisation, and at that point um, for that sort of product we're typically looking at an age restriction of some kind, right? There are, there are other um, films that might have all of the gateways in terms of um, violence, cruelty, Horror, there might be promotion of crime and drug use, you know, all of all of those kind of problematic contents. And essentially we do a kind of prevalence and intensity test of what is the content, how much of it is there, how intense and graphic is the depiction, and we and we work out an approach in terms of age restriction and warning. So how much of this is driven by evidence and how do you gather the evidence to help your decision making? So a lot of this is driven by evidence. So the, the conceptual framework for the Act itself um, had a reasonable amount of thought put into it, um, even though it's dated, and I think it's um, in need of uh, you know, refreshing given the amount of change in the media environment and kind of the context. Um, I think the thinking, the fundamental thinking in terms of applying those gateways and also ensuring that actually any restriction that's applied or any censorship as such is all premised around harm. You know, the risk of harm to an audience, particularly a young audience, as opposed to other considerations such as offensiveness or maybe how problematic it is to, um, to the, the ruling party of the day, which is something you also see in other classification mm -hmm. regimes. So um, I think where we're at is we have that framework and now we're currently in a a space where we need to continually apply fresh research evidence and input on an ongoing basis. Why? Because societal modes, um, attitudes, 
and um, ways that they consume media are moving so fast. Mm -hmm. So, you know, our, our kind of standards from um, a decade ago um, are at real risk of being out of step with the times. Um, and so what we do is we run research programs periodically to, to reach out to young people primarily, but also parents and guardians and teachers mm -hmm. um, to get input about what they're seeing and, and kind of their reaction. We also get real-time feedback from people. If we get a classification out there that misses the mark, the public will tell us about it. So we get kind of real-time kind of feedback um, when, when people think we haven't got the classification right, which we can feed into the mix. Um, and we also survey as well, routinely. Mm -hmm. um, and, we, and also, um, we, we make use of overseas surveys. So the BBFC in the UK recently completed a 10,000 person kind of consumer survey testing out attitudes around thresholds and what people actually want to be warned about. And interestingly, out of that survey, um, it seems to have pushed the UK classification approach closer to, to, to where we were sitting in terms of making sure that we warned about sexual violence in particular um, and self-harm and suicide content. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the classification system in many ways seems to be palatable uh, to, say, you know, the libertarians who... Would be concerned about free speech, uh, but it's the more censorship-based um, domain that uh, seems to trigger a lot of responses. So, you know, let me begin by asking: How do you differentiate between when to classify vis-a-vis -vis when to ban a content? Mm. Well, that, that's a really interesting one because um, I don't think there's that many authorities around the world that have the function that we have in New Zealand in terms of covering the full span, in terms of commercial content and the, the material that's, that's sent through um, from law enforcement. And, and when you're in that position where you're covering that field, as it were, you see there is no bright lines, actually. The, the, these are all shades of grey and nuance and context dependent. Um, so, you know, we, we are absolutely aware that there is a big difference between age restricting, even at an R18 upper level, and classifying something as objectionable, which means actually you're at risk of going to jail if you view it, possess it, distribute it, create it, etc. And we have very high penalties, um, which is, I think, appropriate when you think about some of the material that, that falls within that category. So, so whenever we're looking at something and we're thinking about an objectionable classification, we're very aware of that significant tipping point. Um, but, you know, again, that's a, that's a core part of our function and we're well aware of, you know, we have a jurisprudence, I guess, of decisions in terms of um, different categories of material that go up to and cross that line. Um, it's, I think it's really important um, now more than ever um, when free speech, liberty, what is truth uh, are, are such a matter of debate and kind of being tested so significantly in so many ways um, around the globe, not just in New Zealand. I, th I think it's a vital kind of real ongoing conversation to be had and I'm keen for people to understand and be aware as far as is possible of how we think about things in the framework we apply and push back on us if we think, you know, if, if people think we're, we're getting it wrong. I think it's, it's a matter of balance mm -hmm. and that balance point in any given case um, can be hard to find but we just need to keep testing that and communicating that. So, you know, let's uh, get to a tangible case, you know, the Christchurch mm. Terrorist Manifesto. Um, you decided to ban that. Mm. Uh, what was some of the thinking underlying the decision to ban it? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I guess um, the, the Christchurch attacks had a number of products actually associated with it. Um, and we've banned two, basically. We've banned the live stream video, um, which was done within a matter of days of the attack. It was probably one of the cl quickest crown classifications we, we had done, and I, that was a situation where I called that product in. Um, 
it was under that pathway mm -hmm. that we that we assessed it and there wasn't a lot of controversy around that decision in terms of the live stream video um, people found it an awful um, harrowing dreadful thing to see if they were unfortunate enough to see it um, they could see for themselves the um, the elements of branding and promotion that were that were throughout um, that 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 product, that video. Um, but at the same time, we realised we needed to also address the associated product that was um, closely tied to the attacks, which was the Great Replacement so-called manifesto document. Um, and, and that took a little bit longer to work through. It's a, it's a lengthy document, nearly um, over 70 pages in length. Um, and essentially, when it came to looking through and assessing and determining the status of that document, we very much relied on the framework that we had applied to other terrorist promotional literature that we had had through the office. So we had assessed a number of um, known terrorist organisation magazines, um, also promotional videos, but, but written material and literature as well. And what we're looking for is um, direct promotion, exhortation to violence and extreme terrorist mm -hmm. acts, um, justification of you know essentially killing and terrorist acts. Um, we're looking for indicators such as method, um, areas for attack, and so forth. Um, and as we worked through that document, we saw all of those elements, just mm -hmm. as we had in, in other um, terrorist promotional publications that we had decided to to ban previously or, or classify as objectionable. And, it, and that was, you know, um, that was kind of interesting to me in some respects because my initial thought and in, in very quickly glancing at this document and, and looking at it in a very superficial way, I could see the commonalities that it had with a lot of hate speech and kind of mm. white supremacist material that is um, kind of repellent actually but, but would not trigger a terrorist promotional um, categorisation under our law. But as we worked through and applied our framework to that document, it met all the criteria, um, which meant that we could still be wrong about that assessment. Um, we're not the ultimate arbiters of truth, we're just the organisation that is tasked to, to make that assessment and make that call. We can always be wrong and there's always a way of testing that out and, and taking us to a board of review if you don't agree. But, you know, my sense was if we were wrong about the Great Replacement document, then we're also wrong about, you mm. know, ISIL documents that seem to present a very clear and present threat and um, danger of, um, of imitation and following the, the exhortation to violence that those documents contained. Mm -hmm. So, you know, th this seems to be um, an interesting uh, line, which is, you know, how you operationalize hate speech um, that might, one might argue that that um, invites at the end uh, violence uh, by propagating hate. So, you know, there's so much Islamophobic speech, for mm. instance, that mm. falls under that category, vis-a-vis -vis what you describe as terrorist um, uh, speech promotional. or mm. promotional. So, what is the, how do you differentiate mm. and where do you draw that mm. line? So, the line is not a bright line, right? Yet again, all of these things are context um, dependent and in shade. You know, it's, it's a continuum, I think, is, is something that everyone needs to realise in this space. Um, when I think about the difference between terrorist, promotional, objectionable, illegal literature and hate speech, um, I am thinking about really quite tangible and identifiable elements of promotion to kill mm. or to commit terrorist acts um, as opposed to um, ideological hatred, vile, you know, um, denigration, all, you know, mm -hmm. all, all of those elements that get packaged up in hate speech as a very broad category, right? So the way I think about it is um, hate speech is a very broad span category that actually can set up the conditions and kind of promotion mm. 
mm. as people step through the pathways to radicalization, mm. right? So I think um, there's some very good ac academic work breaking down, you know, some, someone doesn't wake up in the morning and go, I'm a white supremacist shooter and I'm gonna, you know, commit a horrendous act. They go through stages of radicalization and, and as they go through those stages, they start consuming and producing hate speech for, for want of a, a, a better term. Um, but there's a, there's a tipping point in my view where that sort of speech, which is a problem, but not un, unlawful under our act, tips into being unlawful under our act, which is when people are going, you know what, these people are not human and they should be killed. Mm. And at that point, and, and this is what I'm gonna do and you should do this too. It, it, that, that's, the, that's broadly speaking the kind of tipping point where you've gone from hate speech to this is promotion of extremist violence, whether it be online or um, you know, in an analogue printed mm. publication or whatever it may be, yeah. that's the tipping point. So I, I think your question though does raise a very good question about, okay, well, we've got a, we've got a hammer <laughs> under New Zealand law to deal with kind of that end. But does that mean there's, there's no remedy or addressing the, the broad span of hate speech that, that gets you up to that, that hard end? And I guess um, that opens a whole range of responses and thinking around what's happening right now with the Christchurch call and social media, thinking about their terms of use and kind of moderation policies, mm. which we're seeing you know, some, some, I believe some, some real tangible recognition, some steps around, actually we've, we've got a role in this too, and actually if we apply our policies, if, if we have our policies right and we apply them in the right way and we're transparent about that, we can, we can do something about that broad catchment. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there are three things that jump out to me as you describe this. One seems to be that you have a fairly clear operational uh, definition uh, the second seems to be um, a commitment to transparency and making visible uh, the criteria. And the third seems to be a deliberative space for discussion to figure out what that space is going mm. to be and where that line is mm. going to be, right? Um, now, how then, you know, with uh, this kind of a framework, uh, do you juxtapose it in the backdrop of the argument that, um, you know, even just setting up a framework like this actually is an attack on um, freedom of expression, mm. especially in a society like New Zealand mm. that is at the forefront of um, sort of struggles for freedom of expression? Mm. So I, I actually think of my role and the role of my office as a protector of freedom of expression. <laughs> I actually mm. think what we do is a critical element of um, maintaining the integrity and shape around uh, freedom of speech and freedom of expression, which seems contradictory. In fact, it's paradoxical. Mm -hmm. But it was Karl Popper, I think, who wrote Actually, I think he was based in Christchurch when he wrote a very influential book about open society and its, and its enemies, where he surfaced exactly this paradox, which is, guys, if you are serious about having an open society and, having, and giving your populace freedoms and freedom of speech and freedom of expression, um, you've got to have clear rules. Because if you have no rules at all, then that fact will be used against the open society, against the population. In fact, freedom of speech will be weaponised. It will be weaponised, and it will be weaponised by criminals, by terrorists, by despots, by those who you know, have anything but free freedom of speech in mind. Um, and that was, that was written pre-World War II, and I think it holds true even more today in terms of going, this is, you know, freedom of speech and freedom of expression is a really precious value. It's under threat in all kinds of unpredictable ways, I believe, right now, from all sorts of directions. Um, but it is precious and it's important. And if we value it, then we need to be really, really clear about what the rules are around it and what the boundaries are around it, because every society has boundaries around it, whether they want to admit it or not. Mm -hmm. um, and if, if you're going to have boundaries, then you've got to be really clear about who sets those boundaries, 
how negotiable are those boundaries and how transparent are the decisions around those boundaries, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think actually, I'm biased, I guess, but I think the New Zealand system of having an independent body mm -hmm. And someone accountable to the population for delivering on on those lines and those boundaries according to rules and principles set by Parliament, um, and and able to be you know held to account and um, reviewed by anyone who's unhappy with any decision that that they make, and who explicitly is not actually beholden to um, exercising that power that that blunt tool of censorship in the service of the state. It's okay. got to be in the service of the people and making sure that harm prevention is the only operating principle here. If you've got those elements, I think you've got at least the beginning of a coherent, sensible approach to protecting those, to having some, some shape and some boundaries that people understand and can sign up to or not, or debate, or shift, mm -hmm. right? So, and I think, you know, I think you see all sorts of different approaches around the world to this, which are deeply problematic. You've got, you've got Chinese approaches to censorship, which is fundamentally, if you are saying something that is a problem to the state, then you will be censored. Mm -hmm. So that's a huge problem, right? So that, that underpins everything that we in a free and liberal society would kind of recognise as one of the core values of freedom of speech, right? Mm -hmm. Takes that away, puts it, puts the power of censorship in the service of the state. That's a problem, you don't want that. And then you have um, other approaches, um, you know, the US for example is held up as a, as a high water mark for protection of freedom of speech. But in fact there's all kinds of impositions that they apply to speech in all kinds of ways. You know, you can be imprisoned as, as a young person for having pictures of your own naked body on your mm -hmm. cell phone, for example, in some states in, in the US. I don't think I'm off beam in saying that, so under child pornography laws. So that, that seems strange, doesn't it? It doesn't mm -hmm. seem really in, in, in accordance with what you'd see as a, as a truly ideal functioning um, society protecting freedom of expression and you know, um, self-expression and freedom of speech. So no system is perfect. Every system is, is a compromise between getting the balance right between um, maximising freedom and making sure that, that people aren't harmed. Um, every system is a dynamic balance because it's shifting over time and I think what good looks like is having a system that really is transparent, can be tested and is communicated with the public as much as you can. Mm -hmm. And it also seems that you know what you highlighted about the separation from state and political party power is a key it's crucial. ingredient. Crucial, absolutely. Yeah, the, the more I kind of look at the problems with because censorship is a powerful tool it, it it can be a huge problem um but the more you unpick where it becomes a really significant problem it's where it's put in the service of the state that's that's one of the critical elements to me that indicates that you've lost your way on the the, the balance between freedom and protection yeah. because you're protecting the state right and that's <laughs> and that's you know actually yes. what despots look like yeah yeah i mean you know uh, i was sharing with you earlier uh, you know within the context of uh, my own work and academic work in singapore mm. with the newly introduced protection of online falsehoods and manipulation act um, i among with a number of um, academics uh, wrote a petition uh, because one of the things that we were concerned about is the role of the minister mm. in highlighting uh, a piece of information, say as disinformation, which then places it right into the hands of the state. That's right. That's right. And I mean, and you look at, and then a whole lot of problems seem to cascade from that um, approach, I think. You know, if, if you look at systems operating in, in that kind of way, you, you get other knock-on implications because they're they're essentially running a framework that is not really about genuinely evidence-led protection of the population. It's about protecting not only the state but the state's view of what is offensive or objectionable or should be a problem for the population. Right? right? You're not actually because that's the other key thing here, as you mentioned before in your questions. 
where's your evidence base and how, how do you know that the, the, the principles you're applying around protection still hold true? Because we know they'll be shifting. Right. You know? and, and we know new evidence is coming in all the time. What we're talking about is actually psychological impacts and, um, and the, the impacts over broad population bases to, um, to, to very complex things like the disp predisposition to commit suicide or self-harm, for example. Mm -hmm. Now, that's, that's not a one-to-one -one causality relationship. Um, and you have to take quite a sophisticated approach. But more and more evidence is coming in all the time about you know, where those harms might be and where we should be taking precaution. Right. And in a part of the question also seems to be about uh, who is the decision maker or who has the power to decide. Mm. So if, you were, if your office were to be located within the office of the Prime Minister, mm. That would have very different implications. It would be a nightmare. Then. It would be an absolute. Well, you could, <laughs> you know, you literally, I literally couldn't do my job in, in that in that configuration. But I mean, it's it's not just that. It's also, um, you know, we, we're talking about social media and kind of the role that they have to play in in the kind of pre preconditions and problematic speech. Um, you know, they have tens of thousands of sensors. They call them moderators <laughs> or, you know, content classifiers. But they have tens of thousands of contractors um, located around the world operating to very complex policies mm. that are very hard to kind of communicate simply and clearly and they're shifting all the time. So that to me is, is a problem because actually you've, you've, got, um, you've got a system operating that is opaque. Exactly. Yeah. Just a black box. Yeah. yeah, and it's coming out with results that can, can be kind of, well, puzzling, right? Right. How, what, how this and not this? Well, um, so I think that's part of the challenge ahead of us. Um, you, look, I, th I think we really need to look at, particularly if you look at one aspect of um, media harms, which is online extremism mm -hmm. or um, yeah, ter terrorism promotional. If you even just look at that one element of it, um, you start seeing that to, to really address this significantly, you've got to look at the system as a whole. You've got to look at the state operators and how they operate, not just nationally, but internationally and how we can get commonality of purpose mm -hmm. and get everyone on the same page. And then you've got to look at industry providers the rules that they operate to and kind of, you know, as much as possible, get people more or less on the same page about how the system as a whole works to actually address extremism from its kind of incipient stages through to, you know, the, the really deadly dangerous results that we've seen in recent months. You know, one of the things that seems to be um, the lack of deliberation or opportunities for deliberation mm -hmm. in an increasingly uh, digital um, environment. Um, so how do you respond to that in addressing sort of how you portray this as a complex problem, mm -hmm. which is, I think, the way to do it? Mm -hmm. um, there is no simple, easy, single answer to that. But I think what I'm seeing is um, is a hugely dynamic environment that's only going to become more complex and dynamic. You know, the, the, the technological drivers are not going to slow down. They're going to, the rate of, the pace of change and social change and, and um, you know, all, all of those noise elements are just going to keep ramping up. Um, so that tells me a few things. One is you're going to have critical moments of truth when it all comes down to this in a critical call where everyone is watching. And, and we saw m examples of this post March 15th. Mm -hmm. Ah, well, what are you going to do now? And everyone is watching and that is an opportunity to, to, to make a statement and to provide some context and some understanding of the things that we've had more time to unpack around right. how this all works. But it, it, mm -hmm. gives you a, it gives you an opportunity and a space to to, to, to position and also open up the ground for further discussion around all of these things. I think that's, a, that's crucial. Um, and then beyond that, there's opportunities which are being used to 
broker that international um, government and industry discussion, which we are seeing with the Christchurch call and, and the domino effect from that in terms of the attention on this and the, the common ground that is emerging both internationally between governments and with industry about actually nobody wants this. Nobody wants, you know, nobody wants online extremism. Big social media companies don't want um, vitriolic hatred, you know, mm. being amplified through their platforms. They want to do something about it and they want to be, be good citizens in that regard. So that's an opportunity to make a significant step forward, I think, which is being taken. It's going to take time and it's not going to be easy, but I think it's on the right track. Um, and beyond that, I think I think there is some some positive awakening. I think around the world, the books I'm reading now, the articles I'm reading now about what is actually going on here with mm. you know the the commercial drivers, the digital industrial complex, you know, the attention economy, um, the problem with algorithms potentially amplifying some of the darker um, aspects of human nature. Um, these are all things that I started waking up to when I came into the role a bit over two years ago and I was literally going, I can't believe, you know, literally as I stay in the role, it's like, I can't believe this, can nobody see this, you know, um, because, because I was at the thin edge of the wedge in terms of some of the stuff we were seeing through enforcement agencies and some of the information that we we're getting. And this is now becoming actually a known global conversation about, look, guys, there's some there's some issues here that we need to address. And that gives me hope, gives me yeah. optimism as that, that here again, as we have done before, we'll innovate, we'll have a powerful technology, it can do a lot of good, it can also do a significant amount of damage, but we have to be smart about how we mitigate that damage. You know, the thing with the Christchurch call, which is um, uh, so inspiring, is um, it's... Um, modeling of a way of regulating yes. content um, in a way that demonstrates commitment to freedom of expression yeah. at the core. Yeah, you know, I um, think that's right. And I, and I think that's, I think you're absolutely right. It's a, it's a new approach, it's a new way of thinking about how we get that balance right, which has to form part of the future because we are a global network now. It, it is, you know, it's never going to work to leave nation states just up to reg regulate themselves according to their own set of paradigms that's disconnected to what our neighbours or what, what the rest of the globe is doing. It's good. There is a place for national regulation for sure, um, and that is part of the solution, but there's got to be um, you know, greater coordination, and I think the Christchurch call definitely sets out a bit of a a model for, for thinking and doing that and you're absolutely right as well designing in protections of fundamental human rights as part of what we're doing has got to be a part of that picture as well because then otherwise you spill into oh maybe there's an opportunity for the state to <laughs> you know because there's always going to be those temptations and pressures as um, as things evolve and shift right so so I think you're right you, we've got to keep our eyes on the prize in terms of what are we doing here what's our values that we're looking to protect um, what's the harms that we're looking to mitigate what's the best balance you know what what I find a really interesting sitting here conversing with you is that at the center of, of that Christchurch call is one particular decision that was made it was the banning of the <laughs> video and the document. Mm. Did you think when you were responding to that at that moment that uh, this would become such a, a model for uh, a global community? Um, no, in short, but I had, uh, look, I, I, there's no, no one could predict how, how this is kind of rolled, but I was very aware as we were making those calls that the world was watching. I was aware that everyone was paying attention to what was happening and what we were doing. And what I was saying to my team was, well, no one's, we're, no, we're never going to make everyone happy with what we do here, which is good because we'll just do what we do. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just do, we'll apply the same framework that we always have. We, we've, we've done this before. We've thought, you know, we've done very hard yards actually in terms of dealing with extremely distressing confronting material and all sorts of considerations and coming to a thought through nuanced 
principled approach, right? And we might have been wrong in that, and we might still be, you know, there, there's still plenty of testing to be done, but, but we, we had, we, we deserved, you know, we, we had earned the right to kind of go, well, this is what we think and this is why. And if you, you know, and you may disagree, that's fine. But um, the fact that the whole world was going to be kind of looking at that and picking that apart and kind of seeing how it matches with what comes next was definitely, you know, kind of in the back of our mind. So the principles were already there yeah. in terms of the basic idea of balance and how you walk through yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And, and value as well, right? The value of freedom of speech and the value of, um, of publications and content and depictions of things that have happened in, in real life that may be horrific and extremely distressing but still can be valuable because capturing something that has happened in the real world can have all kinds of values and all kinds of directions that can be hard to assess. But you've got to be cognizant of that. You can't just go, that's abhorrent, we're going to make that unlawful and illegal in any circumstance. You've got to think through, where's this, where does this go to? Is, is this promoting, you know, is this, a, is this a propaganda leaflet for a hate-filled cause that may actually tip other people into, into that pathway? You know, is, is this in that category? So, you know, yeah, so we, we, we had a model, we had a framework, um, and I, I think it is a vital ongoing global discussion as it has turned out to be. Yeah, and you know, it also seems like you said that the way this dichotomy is projected, in some ways it seems like a false dichotomy because then it's binary. all that you're saying, it seems that human rights are at the center mm. throughout the whole piece of the puzzle, that's right. you know? Yeah, yeah, that's right. That, that's one of the frustrating things for me and so much of the um, kind of discourse and the op-eds and the conversations around this is they, is they paint a false binary choice. Look, you've got, you, you pick one. It's you're, you're either in favour of human rights or you're in favour of um, suppression and protection and, you know, kind of all of those things. And it's not that. It's never been that. It's, it's the balance right for, for the community, for the nation and for the globe. And there's different, different trades off as you look at different groups. Um, and it's all got to kind of work together as, as far as complex human systems can. But it's always it's always been about balance. Always has been. Always will be. So you know. So setting up, you know, pick one. I just find very frustrating <laughs> and false. Yeah. Thank you, David, for this uh, conversation. It's been so enlightening to just chat with you and understand your thinking behind some of these processes. Uh, do you have any uh, takeaway thoughts as we wrap up? No. Look. Thank. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I'm used to talking about these things and these concepts in kind of um, 20 second sound bites, <laughs> um, which is very, very difficult. So, you know, having the opportunity to, 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 to dig in and unpack um, the, the elements of this is, is, is great. So thank you for that. Thank you. All the best with the, the work that you're doing. It's incredibly important and hopefully a template for what happens globally in this environment. Thanks very much. Thank you.